Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar entitled Understanding the EEOC's New Criminal Records Guidance, Education and Enforcement Opportunities. This is hosted by the National Employment Law Project, NELP, Community Legal Services of Philadelphia, CLS, and the National Reentry Resource Center, a project of the Council of State Governments Justice Center. My name is Madeline Maley, and I'm a staff attorney here on NELP's Second Chance Labor Project. I'll be your moderator today. We're excited that so many of you could join us. Before we get started, I want to review a few housekeeping items and let you know how you can participate in today's event. The webinar is scheduled to last for one hour, and we'll be sharing the PowerPoint presentation that will guide our discussion today. To be able to answer as many questions as possible, we'll be answering the questions at the very end of the entire presentation. And to minimize background noise, all lines except those of the panelists have been muted. So please type your questions into the question box at any time. It's to the right of your screen. I'm going to be collecting the questions, and I'll direct them to the appropriate panelists at the end of the discussion. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can in the time that we have. However, well over 1,000 people have signed up to attend this webinar, so it's unlikely that we'll be able to answer all the questions that are submitted. Again, we'll be sending you a copy of the PowerPoint via email after the webinar, and it, as well as a recording of this presentation, will be available on our website. In addition, you can always email us or the speakers with additional questions that come up now or in the future. So let's get into the substance. On April 25th, by a 4 to 1 bipartisan vote, the EEOC voted to update and consolidate its guidance on the use of arrest and conviction records and employment decisions. This major development in the field of criminal records and employment provides us all with the opportunity to do outreach, education, and enforcement. And this webinar is a great way to kick that off. I'd also like to let you know that on Friday, the Department of Labor, ETA, released a new guidance describing how the Title VII standards regulating criminal background checks apply to federally funded workforce development programs, including reentry providers and the local one stop. NELP will have new information available shortly on this guidance, as well as a webinar to be announced soon. So keep an eye out and check our website, www.nelp.org. Now I'd like to go ahead and introduce our panelists. First will be Phoebe Potter. Phoebe is a policy analyst at the National Reentry Resource Center, and she'll provide us with some background on the significance of the EEOC guidance across a, a range of interest groups and why it is vital for policymakers to be informed. Our next panelist will be Carol Mioskoff from the Office of Legal Counsel at the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, the EEOC. Carol will provide highlights of the new guidance and will participate in a discussion with Sharon Beatrix. Managing Attorney at Community Legal Services. Through Sharon's questions, Carol will provide additional clarity on the new guidance. Next, we will have Maurice M. Salem, Policy Co-Director of NELP, who will briefly provide us with information on the best practices for employers that is included in the new guidance. Following Maurice will be Pamela Polk, Vice President of Human Resources at Johns Hopkins Health Center Systems and the Johns Hopkins Hospital. As an employer who hires people with criminal records, Pamela will discuss their hiring best practices and provide information on what it really means to employ people with criminal records. Please type your questions into the question panel at any time, and after all of the panelists have presented, I will ask as many questions as time permits. I apologize in advance. I might abbreviate or edit your questions so that we can move quickly through them. Thank you for joining us, and Phoebe, go ahead, please. All right, thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Phoebe Potter. I'm a policy analyst with the National Reentry Research Center, which is a project of the Council of State Governments Justice Center, through which we provide technical assistance to Second Chance Act grant recipients across the country. We're very excited to co-sponsor this event and grateful for the opportunity to provide some introductory thoughts on this critically important topic. Uh, first and foremost, I just want to commend the EEOC for updating its guidance on employers' use of arrest and conviction records when making employment decisions. This is a much-needed clarification that will provide millions of individuals with criminal records a fair shot at pursuing an honest living through gainful employment. Just last week, the National Reentry Resource Center hosted a three-day conference for Second Chance Act grant recipients. Now, the types of programs that are funded through the Second Chance Act are truly diverse, from mentoring programs to transitional housing services to substance abuse and mental health treatment. And yet a common theme that was reinforced throughout the conference is that employment plays a critical role in the reentry process. During the conference, we had the great privilege of hearing Attorney General Eric Holder, 
Secretary of Labor Hilda Solis and Congressman Danny Davis speak, and they all highlighted employment as a key reentry issue. Now we know from the research that the relationship between employment and reoffending is pretty complicated. Just giving someone a job won't fix everything. However, there's very strong evidence that employment can help individuals returning from prison and jail become law-abiding and contributing members of their communities. Having a job enables individuals to engage in a positive, stable environment and contribute income to their family, often generating more per personal support, stronger positive relationships, enhanced self-esteem, and even improve mental health. Now, those are the types of benefits that can really help reduce the rate of reoffending when individuals return to the community. And reducing the rate of reoffending has important societal and economic benefits, including increased public safety, fewer victims, stronger families and communities, and reduced strain on state and local budgets. This relationship between employment and reentry speaks to how important the EEOC's updated guidelines are to the broader reentry field. And when you look at the sheer number of individuals that have criminal records, it makes an even stronger case for the need to update the EEOC guidance. As you can see on the slide, every year, over 700,000 individuals are returning home from prison, and another 9 million are cycling through local jails every year. At the current rate of incarceration, about 1 in 17 white men, 1 in 6 Hispanic men, and 1 in 3 African-American uh, African men are expected to serve time in prison during their lifetime. And we know that individuals that have been incarcerated face discrimination in the labor market and tend to have much lower employment rates than their non-criminal justice involved counterparts. Given these numbers, it's pretty clear that a blanket hiring exclusion would result in disparate racial impacts. And this is why such policies violate Title VII of the Civil Rights Act. However, you know, even if there were no disparate racial effects, just the sheer volume of people that are impacted by the collateral consequences of incarceration is a pretty strong argument for banning blanket hiring exclusion. So with this context in mind, it becomes clear that reducing the barriers to employment is a critical reentry issue. And as such, it's really important that reentry policymakers and practitioners understand these guidelines just as well as the business community that the guidance is targeted towards. Through effective education and outreach around the guidance, we can work to open up employment opportunities for the thousands of men and women re-entering society every year. But this requires re-entry folks to spread the word, to go to your local government officials and request that they step up and enforce the new guidance, to become true advocates and promote this change. We commend our colleagues at the National Employment Law Project for getting this work underway, including hosting this important webinar. So with that, I will turn it over to our expert panelists. I thank you for your time and your interest in this very important issue. Thank you, Phoebe. Next, we have Carol Miaska from the EEOC Office of Legal Counsel. Well, thank you, Madeline, and thank you, Phoebe, for your great introduction. Uh, just as re-entry into employment is a, is a general problem in society, it is also a civil rights issue, especially for African Americans and Hispanic men nationally. As you know, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 prohibits employment discrimination based on race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. Since at least 1969, the EEOC has been receiving, investigating, and resolving charges of employment discrimination that are claiming that employers used criminal records in a discriminatory way. For example, they applied criminal record screens more harshly to minority individuals or they applied it selectively to African Americans but not to whites. As long ago as 1975, in addition, a federal appeals court said that it was unlawful under Title VII for an employer to, quote, disqualify for employment any applicant with a conviction for any crime other than a minor traffic offense. In other words, a blanket ban on people with a criminal record apart from minor traffic offenses was discriminatory. Given this trend in the law, um, the commission put out its for first guidance on criminal records exclusion in 1987 19, and 1990. Again, in 2006, the commission reiterated its position on discrimination and reentry in its Compliance Manual chapter on race discrimination. Next slide, please. 
given that this was an ongoing problem in society, some folks have asked us why we are updating the guidance now. We're updating it now because there's really a confluence of important factors. First of all, criminal records are widely available now, both online and through credit reporting agencies. Given the availability, most employers now do criminal background checks for some or all jobs. At the same time, more working age people have criminal records than they did in 1990. And the government itself is fostering reentry efforts. So the government certainly should speak with one voice here. Finally, for the EEOC, there have been significant legal developments under Title VII, both since 1990 when we issued our last guidance and even since 2006 when we did the update in the Race Compliance Manual chapter. Next slide, please. What I'd like to do now is articulate some of the main themes of the guidance. If you come away with one message, it should be that a criminal background check that asks for a person's entire criminal record is too broad. It won't satisfy Title VII. Now, a corollary to that is that a criminal background check that targets the risks that are inherent in any particular job and finds criminal conduct that relates to those possible risks is going to be an improvement. Additionally, on top of focusing the screen, the EEOC strongly encourages employers to do something we call individualized assessment, which is probably a fancy way of saying that employers should give people an opportunity to explain their own circumstances when it's found that they have a criminal record. Next slide, please. Now, the backdrop to these general rules are some basics about the records about arrests and records about convictions that employers get when they do background checks. First of all, arrests. Arrest records may be incomplete, primarily because events that follow the arrest may not be recorded or may not be shown in the report that the employer receives. Did the prosecutor ever file charges or did the person just go home? Were charges filed, but were they dismissed? Um, and was someone sent into a diversionary program or not? And even if someone was prosecuted, we all know that people are pre presumed innocent under our system. Because of all these issues with arrest records, the EEOC strongly discourages employers from relying on a record of an arrest to screen someone out from employment. At the same time, the EEOC does recognize that sometimes employers will have evidence of conduct the underlying the arrest and that it's possible that the conduct might make the person unfit for a particular position. Next slide. Similarly, there are issues with records of, of convictions. As with arrest records, there are issues of completeness and accuracy. There may be misidentification of the individual, um, confusion with someone else, wrong addresses, etc. cetera. Um, there are also issues with convictions of reports showing a conviction even after it's been expunged or after the criminal record has been sealed, um, or else showing as a conviction someone who went into a diversionary program which in some instances may be associated with a guilty plea, but in some instances, many instances, won't be. So there's a whole level of detail with conviction. Now, given all of these concerns, as I said before, the key with looking at records of a conviction is not to have a bank blanket exclusion, but rather to identify the risks in the job and the risks of relevant crimes and to put a time limit on how long you're going to consider conviction. Okay, those are the main themes and now I'm going to discuss some of these issues more broadly with Sharon Dietrich. Thank you, Carol. Sure. Uh, let's talk about some of the examples of practical applications of the general principles that you have discussed 
and I think the examples we'll be talking about are ones that have been addressed in the guidance, but to whet people's appetite to take a look at it. Suppose a new company takes over a work site, and that company runs background checks on the existing staff, and it finds that workers who have solid work records also have criminal records. If the employer would fire most or all or all of the employees that it finds to have criminal records, could that action violate Title VII? Yes, it definitely could violate Title VII. That presents two issues. The first thing is it tells you how important the individualized assessment is. Because here are people who may have a criminal record, but more immediately, they also have a record of successful, safe work performance in the job. And that certainly should be considered as against the criminal record uh, before someone is terminated from employment. Second of all, if the employer comes in and simply fires everyone with a criminal record, what we're getting at there is one of these blanket exclusions, where the exclusion is not tailored to the particular job, which could run from, say, working in a warehouse without many people around, you know, to working in a position um, with a lot of people, um, access to financial information, et cetera. So there's a huge variation in jobs, and such a blanket exclusion would not take that into account. So that kind of practice which, parenthetically, we do see a fair amount, can definitely be problematic under Title VII. Thank you. Another context that comes up quite frequently is that many national and regional employers use online applications. Right. How can these applications raise questions about criminal records while still being compliant with Title VII? Sure, that's a great question because we do see that a lot, especially in these uh, big, with big employers um, who are regional or national. And I guess what I'd like to start is by essentially drawing a contrast between what would work under Title VII and what wouldn't work under Title VII. And what wouldn't work under Title VII is simply asking as part of the online uh, questionnaire that forms the application, asking if you have a criminal record, and then if someone answers yes, simply you know, kicking them out of the system. That would not be compliant with Title VII. Why? Because it would be a blanket exclusion. It would be excluding anyone with any criminal record from all of the jobs. There would be no tailoring there, let alone no individualized assessment. Um, so what can an employer do in that situation? Um, of course, I'm going to make some general points. Of course, they often are tailored to the particular situation, but here are my general points. First of all, if it's possible in this situation, ask about the criminal record a little later in the process, not right, right at the start when you sit down and enter your name and address at the kiosk, um, you know, if that's possible. Secondly, only ask about crimes that are going to be or criminal conduct that's going to be job-related for the job in question. Um, so again, narrowly tailored, what are the crimes that are relevant to the risks presented when you perform a certain job? And most importantly, when that question is asked about a particular criminal record, let people know that they won't automatically be excluded if they provide the information. Um, that way, they, people won't be scared away from applying. And um, as a practical matter, from the employer's point of view, I think people will be more encouraged to provide an honest answer. So I would make those three pointers moving forward in the positive end of things. Let's move to a third example. Sure. There are and certainly employers that say their goal is to hire quote, only the best of the best. Right. Um, they sometimes use that as a justification for not hiring people with criminal records because they say they are not the best of the best. Are there Title VII implications to that policy? Yeah, well, there are definitely Title VII ramifications for one of these best of the best hiring policies, certainly if it's used as a uh, tool for simply categorically excluding everyone with a criminal record. Um, again, it doesn't really matter what you call it. If you have a policy as an employer that categorically excludes everyone with a criminal record, 
it probably is going to have a disparate impact on African Americans and Hispanics. And then it's really whether or not it's lawful will hinge on whether it's related to the job in question. And if you have a best of the best, um, we're just not going to even look at anyone with a criminal uh, history, you're simply not doing that. And it's definitely going to present Title VII problems. And you know, parenthetically, we've seen this in uh, several industries um, around the country. Anything else, Sharon? Yeah, let's move to a, a different area. Um, sure. The guidance strongly recommends that employers make individualized assessments. And you talked about that in your um, slide presentation. Mm -hmm. A little bit more about what circumstances ought to be considered and how that process should work. Sure, sure. Well, we have a fair amount of information about this in the guidance itself. Um, but and, and in the guidance, we list a lot of factors that be, can be considered. Um, first and foremost, something I referenced before, would be information about any inaccuracy in the criminal record. You know, for example, mistaken identity or inaccurate reporting. Um, second of all, an explanation for some information in there that may be um, ambiguous um, or even misleading. Something, say, about a diversionary program that appears as a conviction without any qualification. Um, or um, you know other information about um, on a sealed record if there's a sealed record but nonetheless it it you know appears in the record um, that the employer sees that kind of thing can be explained and sought out other factors to look at frankly are the age of the individual um, at the time of the conviction uh, recent recidivism studies show that the older a person is at the time of conviction and therefore obviously at the time of release, the less likely they are to recidivate. Um, there are obviously also factors that go to rehabilitation efforts, education and training, uh, to the community support that someone has when they, when they come back. Uh, to, the fa to the family and the community. Uh, people with more family ties, with more structured situations, often do much better. Um, employment and character references also can be useful. And finally, and maybe in a sense most importantly, any evidence about the consistency, quality, or length of employment um, that the person has held, um, either after the offense or even before the offense. Um, can be taken into consideration. Now, these are all things that um, would come up in terms of the individualized assessment to discuss with the individual, um, you know, as to whether or not they should be actually excluded or not. Um, and I should also make the point um, that, you know, employers don't have to look at each of these factors. We should simply list out a lot of factors, any of which uh, may be relevant or not relevant for a particular individual. But we're trying to give sort of a rounded idea of the kind of topic that could be informative. Now, in terms of the process, um, really the process is very, very flexible, and EEOC doesn't regulate anything at all here. Um, but the way we think about individualized assessment um, is that we pair it in our, in our minds with one of these targeted screens, um, i.e., you know, a, a screen that looks at all of the applicants and identifies people with particular criminal records that relate to particular jobs. And that once people go through that screen and say that screen identifies two folks who have recent enough convictions in relevant, you know, in relevant offenses for the job, then that's when individualized assessment you know, kicks in. And that's when you can have this conversation uh, to determine to, your, to the best of your judgment uh, what kind of risk really exists or doesn't exist. Um, so that's the basic outline, I guess, of the process and the factors. I hope that helps. So you mentioned uh, screens that many employers use. Mm -hmm. Many employers have used those screens and called it a day once they get a result, either yes or no, based on the screen. Isn't it burdensome in employers to do individualized assessments in addition to using the screen? 
Well, you know, I mean, on the one hand, if an employer has not looked at people individually before, yes, there will be a little more work involved um, when, when they do start looking at people individually. On the other hand, though, if you sort of step back and look at the hiring process as a whole, this is the way it works uh, for all qualifications in, a, in the sense that the employer screens people for education, for skills, for other criteria and then identifies a few people who it really wants to talk to. And then those people are essentially individually uh, considered. So really what we're saying here is that uh, employers should treat a criminal record just like they treat other uh, factors that are addressed in the screening process, and that the criminal record um, should not be excluded uh, from the opportunity uh, for an individualized consideration. Um, and should be, you know, again, just treated like any other qualification standard. So um, it really clearly is uh, part of hiring generally. Um, employers should give it a shot. It works. And certainly the EEOC thinks that it's uh, really the best bet um, as a matter of Title VII law uh, for the employer to protect themselves against exposure to a Title VII challenge. So I think that should address the concerns overall and put it put it in some kind of context for employers. Let's turn to a different subject. Mm -hmm. uh, you didn't really talk in your slides about another statement in the guidance that people have been struck by, and that's the statement that overbroad state and local laws that prohibit people with criminal records from working in certain fields might be illegal under federal law and that employers cannot rely on those laws as a defense to a Title VII charge that's been brought against them. Won't this statement in the guidance potentially put employers in a difficult position, and how do you respond to that? Right. Well, again, I think um, the important thing here is to put it in a larger context. Um, first of all, um, just as a matter of the law, um, Title VII has, you know, since since it was signed into law in 1964, included a provision that says that Title VII overrides state laws that uh, call for actions that are discriminatory under the definition of Title VII. Um, this has been in Title VII in the Civil Rights Act since the very, very beginning. Now, I recognize that people probably haven't considered this very much in terms of criminal record screens per se. Um, so I appreciate sort of the surprise, but I do want to remind folks that it is part of the law. And I think if we all sort of step back and put on our American history hats, we can probably understand why. Um, that said, um, I want to make two other points going forward. Um, first of all, um, the EEOC is not going to be playing a game of gotcha with employers. Um, we simply um, have bigger fish to fry in that we are not going to be looking for employers where, say, they're complying with a state law that has a, an eight-year exclusion and be coming after employers um, because we really think they should be using a seven-year exclusion. I think that's extremely unlikely. Um, to the extent we focus on situations, there are going to be situations where state laws compel what we see as really egregious violations of Title VII, which would be more like things along the lines of you may not hire anyone with a criminal record for this job. That would be the kind of thing. But even that, frankly, is not going to be um, that frequent. Um, and I really do um, want to convey that, that we're, the last thing we're going to be doing is be playing a game of gotcha here. Um, that said, um, we, we have a lot of audiences for this document. And what I mean by that now is that we see as one of our very, very important audiences uh, to be the state and local governments who generally make these laws um, that say that you, know, you have to screen for this crime before you hire someone in this job. They're the ones who write these laws, and they are one of our target audiences for the guidance. So we really um, look forward uh, to, them, to them reading the guidance, and then for them sort of taking it in and considering it and um, ultimately adjusting any state laws that indeed are in 
flagrant uh, conflict with Title VII in this regard. So um, I think in that overall context, uh, this makes a little more sense, and I certainly hope it does to employers. One last question, and an easier sure. one to let you go. Um, how does a person <laughs> record who thinks he was or she was discriminated against uh, enforce his right? Right. Um, if someone's uh, denied a job or fired from a job or gets other adverse employment action, um, and they think it's because of the overlay of a Title VII protected basis on their criminal background, um, they need to file what we call a charge of employment discrimination. Um, in most states, they can do that either with their state or local Fair Employment Practices Agency, which would be like a county human rights commission or a city um, human rights commission or a state agency. Um, and in some states, a few states, they can only come to EEOC. Um, in those states where they can, people can go to their local authorities, they can also come to EEOC. So they would have a choice of coming either to the e local EEOC office or to their state or local uh, civil rights agency and uh, filing an administrative charge that, that um, alleges that there was an empl employment discrimination because of the overlay of race or national origin and their criminal background. Um, now, what happens with those administrative charges is that the state or local agency or the EEOC um, will work with the individual uh, to develop the particulars of the charge and then will assess the merits of the charge and conduct an investigation and ultimately um, will issue a finding as to whether we think it's likely or not that discrimination occurred. Um, at that point, we give folks a what we call a right to sue letter and that means that if the individual so choose they can bring um, a lawsuit in federal district court from the EEOC and I guess at the state or local area um, level uh, they can um, do so also um, and then they can proceed into federal court to challenge this. Um, so coming to the EEOC or the state or local agency is always the first step, and I should say that it actually is required under Title VII. So um, if people don't come, they're going to have a problem later on. So we're, we're the threshold on these issues. Folks file their charges with us. Um, we investigate. Um, we actually do try to work, work things out between the individual and the employer if we think it's likely that discrimination occurred. Um, in some instances, we'll offer mediation services also. Um, so um, that is the basic practice. Um, for people who want to find their nearest EEOC office, you can look on our website, which is www.eeoc.gov. And we have a listing of all of our offices around the country. We actually have a total of 53 offices around the country. Um, and um, you can go to the office to file a charge. Um, and there's also a, a facility we have where you can call an 800 number to discuss the particulars of the situation to see if, if it is the kind of matter that should be brought to EEOC or to a state or local agency. And that 800 number is on our website also. Um, and then finally, I'll put in a plug for the guidance itself. The guidance is on the website, eeoc.gov. And it's actually um, on the home page now. So right when you log on, you will see a link to the guidance um, and to some questions and answers that summarize the guidance. So that's Carol, about all I have. Thank you very much for all of your insight. You're welcome. Thanks so much, Sharon and Carol. Next, we have Maurice Emsilam, Policy Co-Director at NELP. Thank you, Madeline. Um, okay, I just want to start by also congratulating the EEOC for um, for issuing the guidance, the bipartisan support for it, and also just the, the substance uh, and completeness of the guidance, as we'll get into a little bit more in this section. Um, it's, a, it's a very valuable document uh, in many ways. Uh, it's especially helpful to that the, the EEOC really made an extra effort to to provide uh, what they call best practices for employers 
uh, it's a very practical guidance in that sense. Um, so we wanted to make sure to spend some time uh, to walk through uh, that section of the guidance as well. Um, first, um, in identifying the best practices, uh, the, the document uh, makes clear that they're recommended policies. They're there to help employers establish a fair and defensible screening uh, policy that's consistent with Title VII. Um, and uh, it, but they're not required in every case. They're mostly to help create, for employers to have better um, guidelines to create strong standards, but also to create the tightest fit possible to comply with the Title VII requirements. Next, please. Um, <clears throat> so they, they start off, as you'll, if you have a chance to take a look at the document, page 25, 26, um, they start off by talking about the general principles, the very basics that need to be in place for employers um, to have a strong policy that's consistent with Title VII. So they start off, this is reinforcing a lot of what, um, what Carol and Sharon just covered, but they, they start off by talking about the need to eliminate policies or practices that exclude people from employment uh, if they have any criminal record. So getting at, again, the, the issue of blanket policies. And then uh, the other basic concept is that there has to be a, a program in place to train managers and hiring officials, decision makers, on the various Title VII requirements. Next, please. So step two, then, is, um, uh, is urging employers to revisit the substance of their policies. As many folks know, often um, the criminal record ba background check policy is, uh, is something that you know, may have been on the books for many, many years, and, and, and many employers have not taken a look at that policy um, to update it, given all the new realities of criminal background checks. So this is a, uh, they're, they're highlighting um, the fact that it's necessary to take a strong new look at the policy, and, they, and uh, the, the, um, the guidance uh, urges employers to develop a written policy, a narrowly tailored written policy and procedure that includes various elements, starting with um, an analysis of the essential requirements of the job and the actual circumstances in which the job is performed. Um, next, um, the, the, the guidance urges employers to determine the specific offenses as part of this written policy that may demonstrate unfitness for a job. Next, uh, require, uh, urges employers to determine the duration of the exclusions, the specific offenses, and how long ago um, the offenses will be considered disqualifying based on available evidence. So there's some helpful research out there uh, for employers to take a look at to help make some of those decisions in a more scientific kind of way. And lastly, as we've heard a lot about, um, the policy, the, uh, the policy should cover how they're handling this issue of individual assessment, taking into account the age of the, uh, the age of the individual at the time of the offense, rehabilitation, and other and the other factors that, that Carol mentioned. Next slide, please. Um, and then, uh, part of the process of developing a strong and fair policy is also to be clear in the process to document the policy's rationale. So that involves um, creating a record of the justification for the policy and the procedures and the types of consultations that took place with, uh, with experts and on the research side to help craft the policy. And then, of course, um, they make the strong point that it's important to then, once you have the policy together, to then train the key staff in how to implement the policy and the procedures. Next slide. There are a couple other additional precautions they, they lay out in, in the best practices section. Um, the EEOC says that when asking questions about, a crimin about criminal records that the employer limit the inquiries to the records for which the exclusion would be related for the position and consistent with business necessity. In other words, I think they're trying to discourage employers from, from uh, taking part in a sort of fishing expedition or reduce the arbitrariness of the, uh, to limit the question so that you don't get into an arbitrary evaluation of all the various offenses uh, that, that, um, that may exist, whether they're disqualifying or not. 
And then, uh, of course, um, they make a strong point that uh, to keep the record, in, the criminal record information confidential. It should be there. Uh, you know, I think we'll, we'll hear more about this from other folks, but uh, it's not information that should be shared with anyone other than, than the hiring managers. And lastly, um, next slide, please. L lastly, um, and this is, will be of a lot of interest to a number of the reentry groups and others who are working on policy issues as well. Um, they, the guidance, um, page 13, 14, recommends uh, a best practice, and I'll just read the quote here and then talk a little bit more about it. It says, as a best practice and consistent with applicable laws, the commission recommends that employers do not ask about convictions on job applications and that if and when they make such inquiries, the inquiries be limited to convictions for which exclusion would be job related for the position in question and consistent with business necessity. So that's getting at the issue of removing the question about criminal records from the job application and then asking if necessary at the end of the hiring process and then whatever, whatever questions are asked later in the hiring process that they be limited to those types of offenses which could be considered disqualifying. So with that, we're going to move on to Pamela, who's going to uh, provide some information on the, the John Hopkins uh, hiring process. Uh, thank you very much. I'm uh, very honored to be asked as an employer to speak on this topic. Um, I want you all to know uh, that sort of a disclaimer that uh, we were doing this for uh, over a decade now, long before the advisory came out. So now that the guidance is out, we may have to make some changes. So please, my friends at EEOC, don't uh, judge our program or what we're doing uh, based on the new guidance, because this is old information that we've been doing for a long time. Uh, just a little tiny bit of background. Uh, Johns Hopkins is a large hospital and health system on the East Coast in Baltimore. Uh, we're over 100 years old. And we have, uh, I guess I can say with some humility, that we have a good a reputation both nationally and internationally. The U.S. News & World Report has voted us the best hospital in the country for the last 21 years in a row, so we're really proud of that. I give you that background, though, to say that um, we have decided as part of our workforce plan uh, to do what I call non-traditional hiring. Uh, we get 12,000 applications a month, and that's just our main hospital. We actually own six hospitals, but at our main hospital, we get 12,000 applications a month. We hire about 2,000 people a year. But that means that we really could take the cream of the crop. We do very little advertising. We get lots and lots of people wanting to work here. Um, so we could really pick um, whoever we wanted to, and we actually choose uh, to include um, uh, ex-offenders in our hiring population. In fact, it may not sound like very much, but over 6% of our hires, so that's over 100 a year, are people who do have positive criminal uh, records. Um, next slide, please. Um, I included this, um, this website. We're not going to look at this uh, video now, but I do want to encourage you, particularly if you're um, out there and you want to encourage employers to get involved, this is a, a pretty, um, uh, I think, easy way to tell the story from an employer's perspective. It's the Past Forward uh, website. You all may have heard of it before. It's a collection of videos that are done by offenders who have gotten jobs and by employers who are hiring offenders. And they each tell their story in about four-minute segments. And so this happens to be the website for the one for Maryland. but. I believe that these are, um, uh, many other states have this as well. This happens to be the, the link to the one that I did that tells the story of Johns Hopkins. So I would encourage you to look at either that or some of the others if you want to use it as kind of a kickoff uh, if you're trying to encourage employers to get involved. So next slide, please. Let me tell you why we did this. Uh, we didn't do it because the EEO said we needed to. Uh, we did it because it really is very fundamental to our mission. Uh, but not just, we, we don't do it for, um, uh, as a social program, it's really good business as well. So John Hopkins um, was a, a gentleman back in the 1800s who uh, established the hospital and the university, and he believed that we were of the community, that we had to be a part of the community, and that what we did was really for the people of the community. And so we believed that if that meant we were serving the patients, that that also meant that we bring them into the workforce. Uh, East Baltimore is a very 
crime-ridden area. It's a very de was a very declining neighborhood. It's not now. It's coming back now. But uh, back in the 60s and the 70s, when all everyone else was leaving the city and all the other hospitals, many of the other hospitals left the city. Um, uh, Johns Hopkins decided that this was the 13 acres that he had originally dedicated to us and that he wanted his hospital to be here and that we were going to stay in the city. Uh, we're one of the anchor institutions of Baltimore and just really believed that it was a part of our culture and our mission that we needed to stay here and do the right thing. So we believe, as, um, as some of my colleagues said earlier, that we do believe that, um, that uh, people who are re-entering into our community if they have a job that they're, uh, you know, that they are going to do better, they're going to be more stable in the community. We have about, uh, we have a prison down the street that has been the uh, longest, um, the longest continuous use prison in the Western Hemisphere. I've heard that uh, quoted before, and so we have about 6,000 offenders every year who are released into the city. Many of them right here into our neighborhood. Without a job, they're more likely to return to crime. So we believe that by hiring them, it's going to help stabilize the community. The other piece is that they really do make great workers. So if you'll show the next slide, I'll tell you how we've done this uh, prior to these guidance. We do ask on your application if you've, uh, if you've been arrested or convicted of a crime. Uh, but we put the word out on the street that if you are honest with us, that will not necessarily bar you from employment. And so um, our referral sources know that they have to be honest. We think that's an important thing, first of all, to ask the question, because the very first thing we're going to do is we're going to look at, the, at their record, and we're going to compare it to what they told us. If they were honest, that's the first clue that they could be a good employer, the employee. If they're not honest with us, then that could be a that's that's a, a problem immediately. Just like uh, not telling us about your credentials or your um, your education accurately. We do not have a program. We have guidelines. Um, we um, people often call me and say, "Can I get into your extender program?" And I said, "We don't have a program. Just apply normally, and it's it's just a part of the fabric of how we do our business." So our recruiters then have guidelines. They look at the pattern of the offense, the type of the offense, the time of the offense, the age of the offense. Have they been through, through rehab? There's a one-page list of things, all the things that are that you heard about earlier. That we look at that and we compare it against the specific job. Um, and the way that's done is when the the person is chosen for the job, we then run the criminal background and then we go, okay, this person has a criminal background. Let's compare it to what they told us. And yes, they were honest. Then it goes to the head of human resources recruitment and to someone from our security department. Those people then sit down and compare the job that the person is going into and the, um, uh, the background that they have. Um, so just as a, as a quick example, uh, someone who has had drug offenses, we're not going to put them working in the pharmacy, obviously. Um, if someone's had a theft, we're probably not going to have them cleaning offices at night. Uh, we don't want to put them in a position where they might be unsuccessful. But more often than not, we do hire the person into, uh, into that job. Here's a key that's always been a key for us. If they're hired, the background is kept in a confidential folder in HR. Uh, the manager is not told um, that this person has a criminal background. And the reason should, to all of you on the phone should be very, very obvious. And that is, is that as soon as someone's wallet went missing, uh, they would think that it was that new employee who had done it. And so we keep that um, in, the, uh, in the HR office and keep it confidentially, confidential. Uh, we do have, we have coaches that are assigned to many people who are in transition, all kinds of transition um, positions. And so we would assign a coach um, to folks that we think might need to um, have a little bit of support, not for our security, but more for theirs. I want to just quickly give you two follow-up studies that we've done. Uh, we're a research institution, so we like to have uh, data uh, to prove that what we're doing is the right thing. And I, by the way, like to call this people with positive criminal backgrounds. I think it sounds better than an ex-offender. And um, so I had a, um, someone pull just a sample from five years. Uh, they pulled 79 people who had been convicted of crimes. I asked them to pick people that they believed probably had served time. We don't always know that, but they could look at the record, and it did appear that they had served time. And I asked them then to uh, go back and 
night to in 2005 and look at where those folks were. Of the 79, only one had been involuntarily terminated, uh, two had left on their own, uh, one was a leave of absence, and two we just couldn't track down. So 73 of them were still employed at Hopkins in 2005. Some of them had been hired as much as five years before. So in um, 2009, I did a little bit more rigorous study, and we took everyone who had been hired with a criminal background from 2003 to 2006. There were 491 folks who had a positive background. Uh, 49 of the applicants, 41 percent of all applicants with positive records were actually uh, hired. Now that doesn't just mean that we had; it, it means that uh, they may not have even been qualified for the job. So we felt very, very good about that. Uh, in 2009, 43 percent of them were still employed at Hopkins. Now, in one way, you may think, well, that doesn't sound like a very high number, but the turnover rate for these employers for the first 40 months was lower than the employees without criminal records. Um, so you're actually better off hiring them from a retention perspective. I do an anecdotal um, uh, observation of my own, and that is whenever we have an employee that, that is, gets, is very problematic, maybe gets in trouble or fired for stealing or fighting or something like that, um, I always go back and ask someone to pull their uh, record and um, uh, I asked them to pull their record to find out if they were one of the folks that we had hired with a criminal background. And in my, in my 12 years here, never once has one of our very problematic employees been one of the folks that we've trusted and hired who had a criminal record. Um, we have, we use some unusual referral sources. Um, we use the homeless shelters. We go out to the homeless shelters and to the reentry programs that you see listed here, and we work with them uh, to pre-screen folks and to help uh, try and do some pre-employment work with them uh, in order to refer them in. So they provide the wraparound services, they provide the referrals so that as soon as they refer someone, we know this is someone that, uh, that they are telling us they believe is going to make a great, um, a great employee for us. And right now we have at least 100 formerly homeless men uh, who work here at Hopkins. And I say I can't give you the exact number frankly, because we don't tag their record in any way to say that they were uh, homeless. And as you know, in that population, that many of them are probably going to have some criminal record um, as well. And then I just want to end with some of the things that we believe have made uh, us successful in being able to do this. Uh, first of all, have the support of your security staff from an employer's perspective. Our security folks mostly come out of the a law enforcement field and so they are very, very supportive and want to give people another chance and they understand that um, recidivism is decreased by having people have jobs. And um, the, uh, we, we, the screening process that I already talked about, uh, we oftentimes, if we're going to put someone through a training program, we have the uh, supervisors hire, uh, interview them before we ever put them through the training to make sure they're going to be somebody we hire. I love using paid internships that helps our supervisors um, know that this is going to be a great worker. And so I love that for any kind of, not just for our uh, former offenders, but anyone who has any barrier to employment. And then job coaches I think are great in supporting transition. Happy to talk about any of these in more uh, detail, but I know we want to have some time for uh, questions. So I'll turn it back over to uh, Madeline. Thank you so much. Thank you to all of our panelists. So we're running a bit behind. I'm going to breeze through some questions. This first one, Sharon, looks like it would probably be best uh, answered by you. And the, the question is, is, do you recommend that clients provide a letter of circumstance explaining their conviction and or federal bonding papers at the time of application? Hmm. Um. I'm not sure there's a right or wrong answer to that. It may depend in part on what your record is. It may be that the more that you feel you will benefit from making an explanation based on what's going to appear on your rap sheet, uh, the more it may make sense to um, provide that information up front. But I'm not sure there's an absolute best practice answer to that question. I certainly would recommend that everyone uh, who has a record think about how they're going to answer the question about their criminal record and, and what they're going to say as a mitigating circumstance um, ahead of time. But I'm not sure that in all cases submitting something like that makes sense. 
Excellent. And so then Sharon or Carol, do you have any specific language that charging parties should be sure to include on an EEOC charge? Uh, this is Carol. Well, there's no magic language, um, but the bottom line is that someone needs to assert that they um, are alleged discrimination um, on a basis that's protected by Title VII, which would be race, national origin, color, religion, or gender. Um, and this guidance, as you know, focuses on uh, race and national origin, especially for men, uh, because that's where the uh, major social uh, problems exist. Um, but that's not to say that um, you know, some other national origins, et cetera, could be implicated here. The bottom line for filing a charge under Title VII is to allege discrimination on one of the bases that are protected by Title VII. Okay, and so a follow-up question similarly um, would be, if there is a policy or practice that an employer has regarding the number but not the nature of convictions a person can have, would the EEOC look askance at that? Okay, a policy, so you're saying an employer has a policy that they absolutely say, for example, we're not hiring anyone with more than two convictions. Exactly. Okay. Well. You know, um, I think, frankly, any kind of uh, very rigid rule that draws a line in the sand like that um, could be problematic. Um, and I emphasize could. It depends on the situation. Um, but um, if, if they say two offenses, and that would include very, very minor offenses, obviously then an exclusion might not be job-related consistent with business necessity. But if the offenses are more severe, um, it might be reasonable. Um, so it really is going to sort of depend on, um, on the circumstances, the offense, the job. And frankly, um, I guess one topic we did not discuss is federal law. So there are a lot of federal laws requiring certain background checks and exclusions for certain crimes. And if an employer is acting uh, within the scope of such a federal law, that would be a defense under Title VII. And we had a couple questions about whether or not Title VII applies to volunteers and whether or not it applies to temp agencies. Yeah, good questions. Um, Title VII does not apply to volunteers. Title VII only protects employees. Um, so that's the answer to the first question. Um, in terms of applying to temp agencies, um, Temp agencies, although not specifically listed in Title VII, can be covered in two ways. One is if they function as a, quote, employment agency, which is defined by Title VII as an organization that um, seeks employment for individuals, um, seeks to match up people with jobs or jobs to people. So if they function in that respect, they would be covered as an employment agency. Sometimes temp agencies function as what we call joint employers with, with um, their client um, in the sense that they essentially jointly define what the terms and conditions of employment are or uh, jointly uh, supervise the people or evaluate the people. And if they are, are functioning as joint employers, then they also would be covered by Title VII as employers. So that's Excellent. the bottom line. Thank you so much, and I'm sorry, we are out of time here. Um, I just got a 30-second notice. So I wanted to thank all of our panelists again and all of the 600 attendees who logged in. We will be providing you with the slides that were used to guide this discussion today and the PowerPoint, and, and the presentation itself will be available on our website, www.nelp.org. Thank you so much.